Hello, this is Charming Quarks, a scientific podcast. My name is Caroline and I'll be looking top down and bottom up at some strangely interesting yet charmingly beautiful scientific discoveries. So thanks for tuning in and I hope you enjoy this scientific soundbite. So you may have seen in the media reports about a solar impulse aeroplane. Now this is a concept that's actually come about from two Swiss gentlemen, Bertrand Picard and André Borschberg. They believed that it would be possible to harness the solar energy and create a lightweight aeroplane capable of flying incredible distances. Now they've just completed a record-breaking flight. They flew continuously for four days, 21 hours and 52 minutes and they covered 7,212 kilometres, an absolute phenomenal achievement. Now what isn't quite so widely reported is that Bertrand Piccard himself actually comes from a long line of family scientists and inventors. And so although these exploits are very worthy of a podcast in their own right, today I'm actually going to talk about Bertrand's great-grandfather and discuss the dizzying heights that August Picard reached in the first attempt to get a man and his balloon into the stratosphere. If you've ever seen the cartoon Tintin, you may recall a rather tall scientific character called Professor Calculus. This character is actually based on the real-life scientist August Picard, who, born in 1884, went on to lead a fantastic life of scientific adventure. Encouraged by his father, August attended the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology and in 1910 was recorded a degree in mechanical engineering. He went on to complete a Doctorate of Science in 1913, where he was examined by none less than Einstein. It must have been a pretty daunting test to walk into, however it clearly went well as Einstein and Picard became lifelong friends. Throughout his career, Picard was involved in a really diverse range of experiments. In his early days he studied magnetisation, did calculations that helped predict the existence of the uranium-235 isotope, and also performed experiments exploring whether the speed of light was constant. However, I am going to focus on his efforts from the 1930s onwards, when he became interested in manned space balloon flight. These days, thanks to the tireless work of scientists and engineers, we know an awful lot about cosmic rays. We know that they're formed when a giant star dies, and that actually a cosmic ray is an accelerated high-energy particle, like a proton or an alpha particle. These travel at speeds near that of the speed of light, and when the particles enter the Earth's atmosphere, they start to collide with other nuclei. And that gives rise to things called secondary cosmic rays. Like, right now, you'll have one muon particle passing through your fingernail every minute. And that's come about because of a secondary cosmic ray interaction. Back in Picard's day, in the 1930s, things weren't quite as well understood. So a number of scientists were looking at radiation, and the thinking at the time was that radiation was coming most likely from the ground or the Earth's surface. So Theodore Wolff in 1909 came up with an experiment to see if that would be the case. He thought that if he climbed the Eiffel Tower, then if the radiation was coming from the Earth, the signal should get smaller. What he did was he climbed up the tower, but actually, at the top of it, there didn't seem to be any decrease in the levels of radiation. Another scientist said, well, maybe you haven't gone high enough, as the scientists started climbing mountains and going up to higher and higher altitudes to see if the radiation levels would decrease, but they didn't. Other scientists suggested that maybe the radiation was coming from, say, the sun, and so a team measured radiation levels twice, once during daylight and once during a solar eclipse. However, even with the sun blocked out, the levels of radiation didn't seem to decrease. And this was a challenge. People really wanted to understand where the radiation was coming from. For August Picard, the solution was pretty simple. If at ground level you were measuring a certain level of radiation, and you went up, say, the Eiffel Tower, and it didn't drop away, maybe you simply hadn't gone high enough. For him, it was all about getting the measuring equipment up into the sky. And to be precise, August Picard wanted to fly his experiment at an altitude of 10 miles above the Earth's surface. Now to do this, August planned to use a balloon, which again by today's standards seems like a pretty obvious solution. However, 
Casting our minds back to the 1930s again, you start to realise just how ambitious August Picard's plan was. In 1862, there was a British attempt to try to fly a balloon to a high altitude. The team managed to reach five miles up in the sky, so it was a brilliant achievement. However, they encountered some serious problems. One of the scientists on board lost consciousness, and another one got frostbitten hands, having to climb the ropes of the balloon to be able to undo the valve with his teeth in order to get the return back to Earth's surface. A French attempt that happened in 1875 unfortunately suffered even more dire consequences. Again, the team was successful in reaching five miles of altitude. However, two of the team members were killed, and the third surviving member became deaf. So there was clearly a significant challenge and problem that had to be overcome if August Pickard was going to reach his altitude of 10 miles. Now what was happening in these ballooning attempts was the team on board were becoming affected by two key things. Essentially, a lack of oxygen to breathe, and the fact that it becomes very cold as you go up in the atmosphere. Now, the reason it gets cold is something to do with the environmental lapse rate. So basically, as you move away from the Earth's surface, the air temperature is going to drop. And it drops pretty quickly, so at 5 miles above the Earth's surface, you're already at minus 40 degrees C. Now, to get into the stratosphere and to reach the 10 mile altitude that August Picard wanted, you're going to have to deal with a temperature of nearly minus 60 degrees. This is coupled with the fact that you're just losing oxygen. So again, on the Earth's surface, all the weight of the air pushing down helps keep the oxygen molecules nice and close together. So essentially, we have plenty of good air that we can breathe. As you go up, there's less weight of air above you, and that means the molecules can spread out. And so basically, you've actually got less oxygen per cubic volume in order for you to inhale. And so this is the challenge that August Picard faced. How to stay warm and how to make sure he hasn't had enough oxygen to breathe. His solution was ingenious. He decided that he would come up with a vessel, a small spherical vessel that would house two men and would provide a temperature environment that could be controlled and allow him to take up some kind of breathing apparatus. What Picker designed was essentially a 2.1 metre ball, made out of very thin aluminium. It had a couple of 8 centimetre diameter windows, and was just big enough for a couple of grown men to sit inside. He painted half of the sphere black, and half of it white. The idea being that as it flew up underneath the sun, each side of the cabin would heat at a slightly different rate, and inside the cabin you'd get a nice even temperature. He also crucially took something called the drug apparatus, and this allowed him to convert a couple of litres of oxygen into 82 litres of fresh air every minute, essential for him to avoid passing out. On board he also had a Wolf electrometer. Now this was the device he was going to use to be able to measure the charged cosmic rays. And, just in case everything went wrong, he had a couple of parachutes for good measure. On the 26th of May 1931, August Picard and his Belgium assistant Paul Kliffler, wearing their wicker helmets for protection, took flight. Almost straight away they had challenges. Their onboard barometer broke, leaking mercury in the cabin. They suffered from extreme heat and stepped on a water bottle causing them to lose vital water supplies. However, they reached an altitude of 9.8 miles and most importantly, managed to touch down safely in a glacier. The flight was a roaring success, and overnight Picard and Kipfler became household names. They had taken a laboratory 10 miles into the air, and they had survived. Flying a balloon at that altitude and safely landing really was an impressive feat in itself. However, the reason Picard flew was to try to measure the cosmic ray radiation. And that really happened on his second flight a year later. Despite his wife and Albert Einstein warning against a second flight, Picard, this time with a different assistant, took flight again in 1932. In his 1932 flight, the measurements that Picard took he recorded in a journal paper. He observed that cosmic rays didn't seem to come from any particular direction. And he also put forward an interesting hypothesis. 
He said from his observations that whilst it seemed that penetrating cosmic radiation did come from cosmic space, he felt that softer components, a sort of secondary radiation, might be produced by the impact of the hard rays on the air molecules. Pickard had done it. He'd flown to ten miles in the sky, taken the laboratory with him, and made useful measurements contributing to our knowledge of cosmic rays. Obviously, loads of scientists have been involved in helping develop our understanding of cosmic rays. However, what I love about Picard is that he had the confidence to trust his calculations and to build a machine which he himself got into to fly to altitudes to collect unique data. He was the first man to fly up into the stratosphere, and not only that, whilst he was up there he took useful measurements that helped contribute to our understanding of cosmic rays. And for that, well, I think he deserves this 10-minute podcast. So I hope you enjoyed this very short snippet into the life of August Picard and the adventures he had in his balloon when he went to measure the cosmic rays. However, this isn't the end of the story for Picard, because he's actually better known for diving to deep depths. But I'll save that for the next podcast. So if you enjoyed this one, please feel free to subscribe, and hopefully I'll see you again for another Scientific Soundbite.